STEM division, which is probably what Erica was te teeing up, but as past division chair of the social issues and management division of the Academy of Management, uh, we, are, we were thrilled to co-sponsor with um, the humanistic management group, this great presentation, really discussion that I think is a long time coming. So I was introduced to Jay Kennedy by, um, by our good friend, uh, Paul at uh, Pitt and so, and Robin Derry. And um, Jay started a conversation with us about talking about criminal justice system. And I think it's a really nice fit for discussions across both STEM and the humanistic uh, management movement. Uh, Paul Harper, that's who I was speaking about before. So anyway, thrilled to be here with you all. I'm thinking, Erica, you're back again. I'm back. Um, and I think we, we should kick off before I, we, we tempt the connectivity gods and goddesses any further. Um, so welcome all. Um, I will start recording. I think Michael and Jill may have already started I, recording. Yes, we are recording it. Great. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so welcome all, welcome to the International Humanistic Management Association Necessary Conversation Forum. Uh, today's conversation is very timely um, and very important on grand challenges and police organization research. Um, it is a collaborative and cross-disciplinary initiative and it's thanks to the vision of today's panel moderator, Jay Kennedy, who I will introduce shortly. Um, along with Dr. Kennedy, we welcome our panel of experts who Jay will introduce, uh, Dr. Boyd, Dr. Brown, Dr. Gao, Dr. Pauline, and Dr. Rush, welcome. Um, this conversation is also um, made possible through the coordinated efforts of the International Humanistic Management Association and the Social Issues and Management um, Division of the Academy of Management. Um, it's sponsored by the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at the Manning School of Business at UMass Lowell, and it's hosted by the Center for Humanistic Management at the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University. I will be posting some Zoom logistics in the chat. We'll ask you to please keep yourselves muted and we'll try to do that as well. We are recording the session. Q&A with panelists and with Jay will be moderated through the chat. So please do put your questions, remarks, any resources that may be relevant to share with others there. We can also make that transcript available to all. Um, with that, I would like to invite Michael Pearson to welcome you all from the International Humanistic Management Association. Michael. Well, thank you, Erica, and thank you, Jill, for jumping in, <laughs> and and everybody for for this interesting conversation, uh, Jay, and and everyone on the panel. Uh, so this is wonderful to see. Uh, I just give you a little bit of a background of the why and uh, the history of the Humanistic Management Association. Um, the the main goal of the Humanistic Management Association is to help us rethink how we organize, and that questions a uh, cause a number of organizational types uh, or, or affects a number of organizational types. And it also impacts uh, how we do science and research in a fundamental way, because it does challenge the foundations of who we think we are and what, uh, where we're going some way in, in life. It touches these existential questions and they are not answered by one discipline. They're not answered exhaustively by any discipline really. Uh, and so it is a conversation that can enable us to get further and make progress. And that was the uh, intent of the International Humanistic Management Association that we provide those formats and throw out these questions. And I think today's conversation is very critical in that sense. And I don't think anybody has the answer, but possibly together we can come closer. So that is the intent of these necessary conversations. And it's also the intent of the Humanistic Management Association. So I invite you all to be part of this going further as well. And thank you very much uh, for being here. Take care. Thank you, Michael. Um, Andy Wicks, I know you're here from the Social Issues and Management Division. Welcome. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. I thought Jill said it wonderfully. Uh, Sim is delighted to partner with um, Humanistic Management. We have a strong overlap in our membership and we fully support today's activities. Look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Andy. With that, and I know you're all here for Jay and our expert panelists, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Kennedy, who's an assistant professor at Michigan State University. 
He's appointed to the School of Criminal Justice and the Center for Anti-Counterfeiting and Product Protection. And he also serves as Assistant Director of Research. He's the faculty affiliate with the Graduate School and affiliated faculty with the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research and the Center for Business and Social Analytics. So you can see there's already a lot of cross-disciplinary uh, background coming into this conversation. Um, Dr. Kennedy's re research explores managerial and organizational responses to employee theft, to the incarceration and post-incarceration experiences of white collar offenders, the sale of counterfeit goods on the internet, and the structure of occupational pharmaceutical counterfeiting schemes. His work has been published extensively in a variety of outlets. He's currently serving as elected board member of the American Society of Criminology's Division of White Collar and Corporate Crime, and is an editorial board member for the Journal of White Collar and Corporate Crime and the International Journal of Cybercrime Intelligence and Cybersecurity. So again, a big, big thanks to Jay for initiating this effort, and I, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Erica, uh, and thanks to Jill and Andy at uh, the Sim Division. I'm a Simian as well, so that's, it's nice that we had that connection. Uh, thank you for hosting this event. Uh, it's a wonderful conversation, as you mentioned, a necessary conversation. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel, uh, the individuals who will be joining me today. Um, and so I'll just go in alphabetical order. First, we've got Dr. Lorenzo M. Boyd, who is an internationally respected researcher in the field of policing. Uh, he is currently serving as Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion uh, and is a former director of the Center for Advanced Policing at the University of New Haven. Uh, Dr. Boyd is a past president of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences and is a life member of the National Organization of Law Enforcement uh, Executives, or NOBLE. He has 14 years of service with the Sheriff's Department in Boston uh, and is a sought after police trainer. He's been so for the past two decades. We've got Dr. Robert Brown, who's Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Criminal Justice at North Carolina Central University. Uh, Dr. Brown has several years of experience as a sentencing mitigation specialist for the National Center on Institutions and Alternatives, where he coordinated offender-specific rehabilitation and supervision plans. Uh, and that was for offenders at the state and federal levels. His research focuses on street-level interactions between police officers and citizens, the influences of race and gender on criminal justice processing, and the impact of immediate sanctions and problem-solving courts on rehabilitation and criminal justice processing. We have Dr. Jacinta M. Gao, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Central Florida. Uh, Dr. Gao's research focuses on police community relations, procedural justice and police legitimacy, and racial issues in policing. She has also examined police policy strategies and training and has worked to train officers on topics such as community policing and procedural justice. Dr. Gao is currently a member of the Fair and Impartial Education and Training Task Force examining possible changes to police academy curriculum. Uh, we have Dr. Eugene A. Pellini, who is professor and graduate director in the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Central Florida. His areas of expertise include police culture, police use of force, and occupational attitudes of criminal justice practitioners. Uh, Dr. Pellini was a co-principal investigator on a large scale National Institute of Justice grant that examined the variation in American use of lethal force uh, policies and their impact on a variety of outcomes. Uh, he's also served as a co-principal investiga investigator for an NIJ grant examining the structure, operation, and effectiveness of early intervention systems that track problematic policing behaviors. And he's a recent past uh, chair of the policing division for the American Society of Criminology. And then we have Dr. Jeffrey P. Rush, who is the chair of the police section of the, Ameri of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences uh, and a past president and secretariat of the Southern Criminal Justice Association. Dr. Rush has more than 30 years of teaching experience and more than 40 years in the criminal justice profession. His areas of expertise include gangs, human trafficking, law enforcement, terrorism, homeland and private security, leadership and juvenile justice. Uh, Dr. Rush is a certified instructor and trainer for community response to active shooter events, state and local terrorism training, and Valor for Blue. He's also a certified gang specialist by the National Gang Crime Research Center. Thank you very much to our distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who has attended. Just to reiterate, we will be taking question and answer through the chat session. Uh, we have a list of questions we'd like to walk through uh, with our, our discussants, uh, and, and we'll lead off through there. Uh, a bit of a lead in how this came about. Um, there are nearly 18,000 independent, or I say independent, law enforcement agencies within the United States, and that's just the United States. So we're talking state, federal, and local law enforcement agencies. 
this past year has been kind of a reckoning in terms of the relationships between law enforcement agencies and the community, particularly communities of color. And so uh, the, the impetus behind this discussion came about uh, as I kind of sat back and reflected on what is going to be the structure of policing moving forward. Uh, as Erica mentioned, I am not a policing scholar. Uh, I am a, a, an organizational behavior and a criminal justice scholar, uh, but understanding that there is a large role to play uh, in terms of cross-disciplinary perspectives, looking at the management of policing organizations, the challenges that organizations face, and how we as scholars and practitioners can come together to develop collaborative solutions from a research as well as a practical perspective to these challenges. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, get it kicked off uh, with, with some of our questions here. Uh, so to begin, um, this session, when this session was planned, none of us could have foreseen the unthinkable events uh, and the acts of violence that occurred at the US Capitol building last week on January 6th. Now, in the wake of that attack on the US Capitol, several law enforcement agencies uh, are still facing some very tough questions about disparities in the responses that they've had to the incursion in the Capitol and those which were on display during Black Lives Matter protests that happened uh, earlier in the year. And so I'll start out with, uh, with you, Dr. Boyd, coming to this question. Then for the rest of the panelists, please chime in uh, as you feel free. Uh, but uh, as we search as a nation, as we search for answers, and as we wrestle with this long history of overt racism, uh, covert racism, fear of black and brown people, what are the key challenges that policing organizations are going to face as they move forward with attempting to build a just and equal approach to handling protests and civil disorder? Lorenzo? First of all, thank you. Thank you everyone for, uh, for coming out and being part of this. And uh, shout out to my former Riverheart family at UMass Lowell. Uh, thank you folks for coming in. I think part of the problem is the way we view policing is problematic because we tend to look at police and try to move forward, but we totally ignore the racist past of policing. The way we train police officers hasn't changed much in the last 110 years. And once we can acknowledge, you know, it, it's really convenient to talk about policing, the start of policing with Sir Robert Peel in 1829, but the inconvenient truth is policing in this country started at least 100 years earlier in 1704 with slave patrols. And if you move from slave patrols towards Jim Crow, toward the black codes, then go through civil rights and then stop and frisk and then racial profiling, there's been a negative relationship between the police and people of color since people of color were brought to this country. And until we acknowledge the racist past, we can't really move forward with this. And then a lot of people wanna talk about reimagining policing. We need to reimagine police training because the way the police came out when they thought of the Black Lives Matter, people who were peacefully protesting in a lot of places, but a lot of black and brown people are, are often seen as the symbolic assailant. And we assume that black and brown people are more likely to be problematic. The thing that not as many people are talking about is the fact that the response um, on January 6th was absolutely coordinated. And now we're finding out at last, uh, last count, there are at least 27 police departments who now have acknowledged that some of their officers were part of the insurrection. So the fact that we can't separate what's going on because there's an inherent problem in policing. So we can't expect the police to police people differently when they're actually part of the problem. Great intro, uh, thanks for that. Um, Jeff, Jacinta, Bobby, Jean, thoughts on, on Lorenzo's comments? I would add that, you know, policing, you know, remains um, as, as many gains in diversity as we have had, which are real, um, there's a, certainly um, a lot to be said for that. It remains a white male dominated profession. And it's hard then, even if you don't, even if an officer doesn't hold, fully buy into the same set of attitudes as the attackers on January 6th, it's still hard to think of somebody who looks like you as a threat. Right, it's very easy to see somebody who doesn't look like you as a threat. It's very easy to demonize that person. It's very easy to call them a threat to national security, a terrorist, what have you. It's really hard to look at somebody who 
has the same skin color bumper stickers as you and think, wow, that person might be dangerous. And, you know, I would guess a lot of the cars parked um, in the places where these the attackers parked had pro police license plate cover, you know, or, you know license plate um, things. And so it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate um, the same way as when you, you know, when a white officer sees a group of black protesters, all the alarm bells start going off. When a white police officer sees a group of white protesters, they think they don't really think anything of it. So we're going to talk about training in a bit, but I'd love to hear some thoughts on that, right? So uh, when we, when white officers, if we say if they had that perspective going into a situation, um, that has to be a training component, right? There's got to be some type of, uh, I would assume, some type of training, socialization, whether formal or informal, going on in the organization. Um, as we look to try and make these reforms, how can we as policing scholars, right? You know, what role do we play in these discussions and in implementing these plans? We're not psychologists, right? We are, we study policing, but you know, what's our role in affecting that behavior? I, I think our role, uh, first and foremost as scholars, we're, we're educators. And whether it's through our, our university roles or, or forums like this, we need to really bring home the message. This is policing in America. You know, that, that, that question of, oh, things are getting worse or there's more racism or more bias today. Is it on a rise or are we actually seeing policing as it has been done and is being done? And I, I think that it's really important, building off the, the previous comments, we need to help people understand the coercive nature of policing. We need to help people better understand that the police are an extension of government and problematic policing, bad policing is problematic or bad government services. And while we, we will definitely talk about training, I think it's been mentioned a little bit uh, ago, white officers, and I'm gonna throw in white officers versus uh, black officers or, other, or officers um, from other backgrounds, policing in and of itself can be very problematic. Um, there are places where there are, the majority of the officers in the agency are black. People experiencing inappropriate uses of force, um, officers doing things to their position that they should not do, uh, no, no color lines. We have a history of it being a white and a male, therefore white male dominated occupation, but we have fundamental problems with the way policing is done. And over the last year, we have seen the way that the police respond to, to certain incidents, to, to protesters. We've seen the police be very coercive, co questionably coercive against elderly individuals, against individuals who are not a threat, against individuals who are engaging in their uh, peaceful protests. And it, so it, we need to be very careful about limiting the discussion, our thinking and our solutions around race. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, our role as social scientists is to provide the evidence and what the department does with it. We can assist them, but I think, you know, many times if we try to overstep our bounds, we miss the picture. Just as many of us are in academic or research environments, if somebody came in and said, here's how you can do your job better, or let me tell you how to do your job. Keep in mind that I've never done your job. We're going to be defensive to that. Uh, and even if we have police experience and we're going to work with an agency, our experiences are an N of one in one agency at one particular time. And so I think our greatest value is bringing that evidence that spans across departments, many police officers, because when we work with agencies, one of the first things that they ask us very often is what are other agencies doing? So they recognize that their department is situated within their area, but they're always thirsty to know what's going on in other departments and other areas. And that's the greatest value that we could bring. And I, I think too, I think it's interesting if you can see behind me, my uh, home office is not 
the best organized in the world, which reflects my department office as well. But I was doing some little house cleaning, waiting for this, and picked up a copy of the criminologist that I had from 2015. Uh, the lead story is, is American policing at a crossroads. Five years ago, we were having this conversation uh, post-Ferguson. So I think what Dr. Brown said is, is significant in that the problems we're talking about today are problems that we've talked about two years ago and three years ago and five years ago and 10 years ago. And we haven't really addressed how we fix those problems. And I think part of it as well for us as educators is perhaps in terms of criminal justice criminology, maybe we need to rethink how we uh, reward promotion and tenure and I know this may be stepping on some toes, I'm not trying to do that, but a, a great number of police chiefs don't read the publications that we publish our research in. I mean, that's a reality. There's some research to suggest that, not a lot about in terms of leaders reading and all of that. And police chiefs don't read a lot. At least they don't read the kinds of of articles that we publish in some of the journals that we have to publish there to get tenure and promotion. So to some extent, our research, uh, which might very well inform the chief in Birmingham or the chief in Dallas or the chief in Houston will never get read because we've not published that in one of the places that they read. Did that make sense? That sounded more logical in my head than maybe it did when it came out. But again, if we're working with an agency, I think I think Gene is right. I'm not gonna to try to pronounce his last name, I'll screw it up. But I think he's right. They ask us what's going on in other agencies. They might know that if they read some of the articles that were published, but they don't read. And I think we have to, overcome that. And I don't know whether that's a university issue to overcome, a tenure issue to overcome or, or not, but somehow we have to get the information out a little broader than perhaps we're doing now. You know, to, to just to dovetail on what Jeff said, let, let, let's be honest, academics, we do write a lot of stuff that nobody reads but us. So the next phase is those of us that did the job prior to earning PhDs, one of the things that I do is I do a lot of police training. I do between 250 and 300 hours of police training every year. That's roughly the equivalent of running a six or seven week police academy. So where do I get the information from? So when I train on culture, it's my job to look at a lot of gene stuff and translate that into stuff that's actionable. And when I'm looking at racial stuff, a lot of the stuff that Bobby wrote about the stuff going on in Cincinnati, that comes into uh, my training. And the rac racially neutral policing stuff that Jacinta does or the police legitimacy stuff, I take a lot of the stuff that we write and I put it into training. So I would argue that the role, going back to Jay's point, the role that we have as academics is to make our stuff accessible to the people actually doing the jobs. So, you know, we've talked about training a bit. Let me, let me you know, take that and build upon that. Um, you know, there's a question here that I want to get to because I think it, it's a nice segue as we're talking about officers uh, and, you know, Bobby's point and then with training. Uh, and it's a comment about groupthink. Right. So as we're training officers, right, we're creating an environment wherein we are giving them the rules of the road. Right. They are being socialized into this role. And we all know, or as criminologists, we kind of know the structure and the nature, uh, as well as the content of most trainings that go on. Um, but is this an issue of groupthink? Uh, is this an issue of individuals coming in with sort of a preconceived set of you know, norms or ideas about the role as a police officer, irrespective of race, just the role of police officers? And is there a role for training in addressing some of those systemic issues that make the police in general uh, wary of particular communities or interacting with particular individuals? If we stop at training, I say that's a little harder because what we do in our academic units is not train, we actually educate. 
So if you mix training and education together, I think we have a pathway forward. But the training is the, the handcuffing, the how you shoot, the how you drive. The education part is the critical thinking. It's the otherness that we're policing. It's the lived experience. So that's that's what we're, we're doing. And acknowledging that in order to be a police officer in, in this country, you have to have a GED and had reached the age of 21. That's it. And we also acknowledge, and I'm not a psych person, but the typical adult brain doesn't even stop developing until 25, 26, 27. But 21 year olds with just training, we give them the ability and the discretion to make life or death decisions. And I think that's problematic as well. I would say that, yeah, to the extent that there's a group think problem, it's fully intentional. It's a paramilitary organization. They intentionally, they use psychological techniques designed to homogenize people, to, to break down their individuality and to socialize them into a group mentality. And so, you know, we, we can talk about groupthink as, a, you know, a problem, but it's, it's 100% the intention of much of police training tactics. Um, so given that, right, we know that the role of police officer training, both at the academy and in service training, uh, as well as the recertification process, right, they've come under fire uh, as being inadequate, outdated, structurally biased, place too heavy of an emphasis on excessive use of force, right, that's been around for a while. The comments in the, in the, in the chat show that, your, your comments have shown that as well. Um, recent Times article noted that the problem with police academies uh, is that the current organizational structure and operational mission is that police cadet or problem cadets are less likely to be flagged before they graduate. The policing methods taught vary drastically across schools and with no formal oversight, instructors with racist and sexist attitudes may continue to teach for years. Um, again, 18,000 independent policing agencies in the United States. When we look at training uh, and challenges to training and curriculum reform that exist, right? Um, how have we seen those things exacerbate over the year? Again, this is an ongoing conversation. So what's new about what's happened recently that's going to change the nature of those conversations? If you look pragmatically, police training from the time you interview to the time you're out on the job, the police in most jurisdictions pay well over $100,000 for that training process. The further you go into the process, the more money they've spent on you, the less likely they are to uh, water, water you out. Um, if we catch it early, we can, but there's no incentive. As a matter of fact, it's a disincentive once you get into the academy to then wash somebody out. So if we can catch it early, it's, it's, it's a better idea. But a lot of these police departments are also uh, uh, undermanned. And a lot of departments are going in with deficits and they need bodies, they need more bodies because we keep doing traditional policing. If we reimagine the way we do policing, that'll force us to reimagine the way we do training. Then I think we can catch some of the, uh, the problem uh, officers as they uh, go through. And to, to Lorenzo's point, if you talk to many uh, an FTO and depending on the agency, the FTO, field training officer selection process, some, let's face it, some agencies are better at, at selecting FTOs than others. But when you talk to a number of them, they want to wash some of these officers out. They really do. They, they don't reflect the culture of the organization. They don't think they're gonna make good cops. They've already demonstrated some bias toward a group or what have you. And as Lorenzo said, the pressure from the bosses is to not wash them out. Uh, not even for that matter to send them back to the academy. I mean, granted, in some cases, it's either you make it or you don't. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced we couldn't add a third option, which is, okay, this individual is not ready to hit the street quite yet. Let's send him back to the academy uh, for more training. Now, again, given our conversation, there may be some problems with doing that, but there's a lot of disincentives to 
let people go once they, particularly once they have hit the academy. Yeah, I think also we, we ignore people's career um, trajectories and after that first year of training uh, at the academy and with the field training officer, what do we do to socialize officers? You know, what type of mentoring is out there? Uh, the good people that do the job well, we very often find that there are no formal mechanisms to make them mentors. So if we judged our students based on the first year of progress and said, should they grad graduate or not? We probably would say no most of the time, right? So what happens after that? And so I really believe that, that you know, we throw officers into the fire, so to speak, and then we expect them, if you've done you know, field work with police and you're in a car and you're seeing all the moving parts, forget about the interactions with citizens, just all the moving parts before you interact. And you say, how do they manage these types of you know, things that come their way? I really believe that we should be tracking officers and, and kind of catching them when they do misstep, whether it's something big or not, uh, and, and trying to work with smaller groups of officers, you know, some research uh, by Jason Ingram out at Sam Houston State, you know, really gotten into the, the smaller context of the work group. And so sometimes we say all cops are the same. And then other times we say all cops are different. Um, I, I really believe that the, the smaller context of where you work with, who, who are you working with? Who are you interacting with? In all of our cities, we have really tough high crime areas and we have areas that are not situated that way. Well, you can imagine that the responses by police and the way that they see their job and their role in citizens is going to differ dramatically across those contexts. And so I think if we can figure out a way to continue to, to monitor officers, whether it's through early intervention systems, and unfortunately, some of those systems are set up that the officers aren't even aware of how the system operates. So there's expectations and monitors out there whereby officers don't even recognize until they're flagged for something. You know, as a teaching tool, I don't think that's particularly effective. It, it does have its role, um, but I think the day-to-day -day operations of fellow officers monitoring other officers would be much more helpful. Yeah, and there was, there was a comment in the chat that I saw go by about toxic masculinity. And, you know, I think that's 100% um, operative here too is that these attitudes are not always considered bad within that kind of cultural environment. They, can, they get rewarded um, sometimes for holding attitudes that are like that. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, there are incentives to either develop um, if you don't have it already or to express it if that's how you view your, um, and so that's, you know, there's there's a, a kind of a, a continued problem. You know, like that's why they took the show Cops off the air, right? Like it was reinforcing these. You know, what does real police work look like? And trying, you know, it was kind of skewing, you know, perceptions as to real cops drag people out of their cars through their window for no reason. And you know, that's what real police work is all about. And so it, it just reinforces that idea that to be a good cop, you have to be extra tough. You have to be hard. You have to just not really care about the, the people you come in contact with. And so, you know, I think that the person who made that comment about, you know, a, a problem with toxic masculinity is 100% on point there. Jacinta, I'm very happy that you brought that up because I, I noticed that same comment as well and wanted to come back because I thought it fit in well with your earlier comments about you know, the relationship between officer race and the people that they're policing, right? So, uh, and I appreciate Bobby's comment about, you know, police being police, but as policing, as you mentioned, right, policing is a very masculine, quote unquote, masculine profession, right? It is it, cops. I, I remember one of the early uh, uh, seasons of cops, you know, guy busts into a room and puts a gun up against somebody's head and is like, you know, feel that buddy, that's cold steel there. And so, you know, it's this image of this is what policing is. The same way that people who want to be lawyers, but you know, the the toxic masculinity I think is is a great vehicle to look at just toxic um, cultural attitudes in general. Um, I think masculinity is is a good one to look at because across race it kind of gets a pass, right? It seems to be acceptable, particularly within gendered societies, and when we look at gender roles within society. 
Uh, but when we, you know, so if we take that, and we look at training, if we really want to affect that, how do we change that culture without doing a wholesale revamp of not only the curriculum that's involved in officer training, but also the way that in which in-service training happens, right? When we talk about field training officers going out there and working with officers one-on-one -on -one in a car, how do we affect that dynamic where these attitudes, beliefs, norms get passed down from training officer to junior officer? So I think that we need to do a better job of recognizing and educating others how policing works. We're talking about a profession that promotes from within. We're, we're, so what you have to start with is what you're going to have to work with as you, you move along. Uh, in the context of gender, if fewer women or fewer people who subscribe to or operate under uh, the toxic masculinity that we're talking about, if there are fewer people there coming in on the front end, there are fewer people who are, are available to get promoted to be in decision-making positions in police organizations. We're talking about a profession that does not really make uh, lateral entry or transfer uh, a beneficial thing to the workers. We're, we're not talking about a profession where you can just go get an advanced degree or even that relationship between the police and the military. You could have a long career in the military and maybe know a lot that's somehow relevant to a police department, but you can't just pop out of, a, of that work and then pop in at a mid or high level in policing without a background in that agency. And we really, really missed, I think, a moment that was happening during the, the heightened focus on traffic stops and racially biased policing and traffic stops. There was a moment where we not only talked about training, we started to pay attention to supervision and frontline supervision and mid-level management supervision, not just focusing on chiefs. Because through all the training, in-service training, reinforcement, when we do not pay attention to frontline supervision, when you do not have people uh, who uh, do not subscribe to that toxic masculinity in sergeant positions and captain and lieutenant positions so that they can, whether they're using data to see, you know what, <laughs> in my area or within, among, across certain officers, we're seeing certain behaviors and we need to do something about that. And that's that frontline supervision that can intervene before there's some critical incident that's caught on tape. That's what we're missing if we're ever going to even have a chance at breaking the cycle. Gene, were you going to chime in? I, I think about first level supervision, and, and that's probably the toughest position in the police department because you're really not part of management, you're not part of the line, you know, so what power do we give those front level supervisors to do their job? Um, they're search, you know, they're thrown into situations that many of them aren't prepared for either as a supervisor. So it's their first level. Um, and I think, you know, putting the onus on them is a little tough, although I like that to be part of the discussion. Um, but those above them, and in kind of trusting their judgment, we got to figure out a way to get that first level really in a supervisor capacity. You know, the, the comparison to the military, the military does a lot of that. As you progress through the ranks, uh, they count your education, your training. There's some expectation that you will, you will have certain skill sets as you move from one to the other. And, and Gene's absolutely right. I know of an agency and they're slightly better now, but uh, you got promoted on, on Friday, excuse me, you had the weekend off and your first shift as a sergeant was Monday, either 11, p 11 p.m. or 8 a.m. or 3 p.m. on Monday. And a number of these guys, then the agency itself, a lot of the old sergeants would just call in sick that day. So now you've got a young, off, young sergeant, probably with no experience, supervising a bunch of cops on the night shift there is, I mean, is that not just a, a problem waiting to happen? I mean, come on, 
that's just it just is. But I also think when we did away with two-person cars, we lost a lot of the uh, training and even education, if you will, that that occurs. And you because what we do is we take the young guys uh, with all of the some of the problems we've discussed, and where do we put most of them most of the time? On the night shift or maybe the evening shift in the very hot precincts. Why? Because the old guys have had enough. They want to work in the suburbs or they want to work on day shift or, or whatever. So you've got these young guys working hot precincts, riding by themselves uh, or talking to each other with no older, wiser individual to help guide and direct them down the path. And that happens at every level of supervision. The lieutenants go through the same thing that sergeants go through when they're promoted and up through the ranks. And they're, you know, the bidding system is effective uh, for assignments, but it really does, you know, squash a lot of this, you know, reform that we could do. Sure, yeah, and just a quick point is, you know, with respect to the FTOs um, that, you know, Dr. Rush mentioned earlier, you know, we, and um, Dr. Paolini has mentioned, we have to certainly be mindful of so, you know, negative socialization influences, you know, who are we selecting as FTOs? But there's also, you know, I, wor I worked with a police department where their FTOs were cops with like three years of experience. And, you know, so we're not talking negative attitudes. They haven't even had time to develop negative attitudes. They have no attitudes. Like they're, they're so new themselves. They're still grappling with it. They're still trying to, to figure out what this job is all about. And now they're training and socializing the next sort of generation of, of officers who are basically, they're part of their own generation. And so it's just, you know, we, there's, it's just there's so many like intricate parts of this to where we're not we're not only you know having trouble with some negative attitudes being passed down but new officers are missing out on as dr rush mentioned a lot of really good institutional knowledge so you know that's a, that's a great point and and lorenzo you've had experience in the field jeff you've had experience in the field there's a couple comments in the chat here that i think are really relevant one about the ever expanding scope of police responsibility. We view them in society as the problem solvers for everything. We don't equip them to be problem solvers for everything. When we're putting field training officers in the field with three years of experience or brand new officers on the hot beats and in the hot part of the city, they may not have seen all the issues that they're gonna run into, right? The guy in the neighborhood who's mentally challenged that everybody knows has an issue but is really harmless can appear to be a legitimate threat for someone who has never had that experience. And so as one of the other comments talked about with this issue of middle and middle management frontline supervisors with a lack of trust and issues of procedural injustice, as they're dealing with organizational issues and now we're thrusting them into situations with which they have not had experience or training, should we not expect some of these issues to occur? I think that's actually part of the problem. And as much as I'm critical of policing, I'm also critical of the bigger system. One of the things that uh, that Bobby and I did in uh, in 2007, when we were in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina together, when the chief asked us to build a community policing program, we took stock in the city itself and realized that it was a socially sick environment. So we in turn built a community wellness plan. And part of that was pushing back on other city services, on noise abatement, on permits, on inspections, having them do their job. Because unfortunately, policing is often used as a social dumpster. Anything that no one else wants to deal with um, gets dropped onto the police. If we can get these other city services to do their job, then we can let the police be the police. And if you notice, I'm not using the term law enforcement because only 20% of what a police officer does is actually enforcing criminal laws as it applies to index crimes. The vast majority of their day is spent service or administrative. So if we let the police be the police and not be all things to all people, then their failure rate will actually decrease and then we'll allow them to be what they are. 
unfortunately, it's still that reactive. Upwards of 90% of policing is reactive. You wait for a crime to happen, and then you spring into action and look for the bad guy. And I'm not impressed by the amount of arrests that you made based on the amount of crimes that are reported. You wanna impress me? Stop crimes from happening because a good police department solves problems before they become crimes. And, and this is another reason why I emphasize the point. We need to think more and more about the police as an extension of government and an extension of government at the local level. When people have unreal, unrealistic expectations of what's going on in their community and they're looking for the police to be the response to, to all problems, we can talk about how the police have been complicit over year over the years in making themselves or taking advantage of being the go-to for so much. But if we're going to focus on breaking this cycle, changing things for the better, we really, really, really need to embrace this. Okay, in this jurisdiction, what role do we want the police to play when it comes to the problems facing our community and what role do we want other agencies to play that they really should be playing to deal with our problems so that the so that the police can do what we really want them to do and through a lot of this discussion about training and things it's training for what I mean, the police are very proficient at tactics and most officers are following the law and regulations. It's the soft skills. It's, it's the soft skills where we need the help and, and, and the mentoring and the development and the supervision and the checks. We're very, very good at getting them to, to be able to do uh, tactical things. Is the provision of soft skills or working on the development of soft skills um, there's, you know, there's been a couple questions here about sort of standardization of training, given variation across bodies. Is that something that you know, could be potentially a, a route to go down to look at a standardized set of skills, experiences, training, education uh, that needs to be delivered to officers that kind of is required of, of all law enforcement officers? Yeah, I think that's are. that's a good pathway forward. I spend a lot of time looking at uh, curricula from various police academies across the across the country. Many of them are, are state mandated. Here in Connecticut, for instance, we have 905 hours of training for the police, but firearms is between 80 and 100 hours. Defensive driving is 40 hours. Defensive tactics about 20 hours. Verbal de-escalation four four hours. So when people get into these confrontations, it shouldn't be surprising that they default to what they train on the most is their firearm because we want them to be proficient in firearms. But yet a police officer could go their whole career without brandishing or discharging their weapon on duty. But every single day, they have to use uh, communications, critical thinking skills, and de-escalation. So we should remember, I keep saying, we need to reimagine training. We should make the important things uh, more time in the academies. Well, that, I think it also, you know, it goes back to, to Dr. Brown's point is that, you know, we, we can't have our police in training 24 hours a day. And so, you know, there's only so many hours in an academy, you know, possible. There's only so many hours every year that we can require from them, you know. And so what do we really want them to be doing? Can we first talk about defining the job a little bit better, defining that role better? And then we can more effectively train on those specific sets of skills. Yeah, and it goes back also to legal liability. I mean, if you're running a police department, your liability comes from force generally, and you want to make sure that you can provide in court how much training you've done in those areas, Lorenzo, whether it's in the training academy or in in-service training. And so we kind of default to the, the officer may not have to use his or her weapon in 10 years of their career, but the one time they do, you never would want an officer to say, well, I wasn't really trained in this, in, in, in using my firearm. So 
for organizations, the safest thing is to kind of overinflate the force training. And then when they go to trial, they can say, not only have I done the X number of hours that were mandated, I went above that. And, and when we take a step back as social scientists and we look at that training and we see the disconnect between an hour of cultural awareness versus 200 hours of you know, defensive tactics or you know, proficiency in your firearm, it looks askew. Um, and so, you know, so, so when, we, when we're looking at the total picture, um, introducing training standardization makes perfect sense as does introducing a uniform use of force policy, but how does it actually work? Where, you know, ask use of force people to agree upon a use of force policy and that will be a total blow up discussion. It, it, will, it would not be fun. Um, and, and you would say, well, it seems so simple. The two ends of the continuum is very simple. Everything in the middle would be cause for concern for people you know, of various backgrounds and experiences. Great, great points. Um, I wanna pivot just a little bit um, and talk about use of force uh, and, and Gene pulling upon your comments um, you know, with regard to the amount of training, why they do it, understandable. It makes sense the way that you laid that out, right? Uh, not only from a legally defensible standpoint, but also from, you know, if you're really concerned about officer behavior and you know that taking someone's life is one of the worst outcomes of a police citizen interaction that can happen, and you want to try and avoid that as much as possible, you want to give people training around that, around that area, right? So, uh, but we know that excessive use of force has been uh, a, a very large issue. Um, there was a 2016 Harvard Business Review article that talked about excessive use of force. And the, the author of the article said that, uh, quote, the only effective mechanism for addressing police brutality is top-down systemic, systemic reform of the police organization itself. Uh, and now police brutality is only one, a very extreme and excessive form of excessive use of force. But given those statements, you know, what are your thoughts about you know, excessive use of force? And do you agree that top-down systemic reform is the only way that we can really change uh, the widespread nature of excessive use of force in policing organizations. Yeah, and so top-down approaches are really not by themselves effective in just about anything. I, I guess, you know, if you could say no, no, no high-speed pursuits is effective, if you make that a top-down approach, you can't use it at all. But in discretionary decisions, um, brutality has no place in policing. Um, whatsoever. So brutality is a fireable, just there's nothing that you can do to fix that if people are brutalizing citizens. Excessive use of force is problematic for us because excessive means it started as justified. And that becomes an issue of either socialization or training that you exceeded the limits for what you were allowed to do as a police officer and utilizing force. And, you know, on the other side of the coin, there's a large amount of research that demonstrates that officers actually use less force than they're authorized to use in most circumstances. Now that that's positive, right? It's the excessive ones that really draw our attention. That has to be, you know, a, a peer and lower level supervisory issue um, because yes, you can enforce a policy on, on excessive force, but it's going to happen after the fact. What you need are in-game decisions that are more, uh, you know, critical and, and thought out as opposed to what did we do? What could we have done better this weekend in our football game um, on Monday? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a yes and no, I think, to that question. The average tenure of a police chief is what, like four years? You have constant turnover at the top of these organizations and for a police department that is experiencing these problems to fully and effectively turn itself around, that takes a very long-term, sustained, constant effort. And it's, it's tough. It starts at the, you know, it does start at the very bottom. Selection, training, recruitment, you know, who, you know, being able to get rid of people very quickly if they are showing signs of problems, being able to retain people that are good. That's the other side of that coin is that, you know, we lose a lot of good people from, you know, from the job. Either they quit the occupation, they go somewhere else, they promote up, 
out of patrol and you know they're you know we have really good high skilled people who are not out there interacting with the public daily and so you know it's it's really a long term sustained effort and you know the way that police chiefs kind of come and go you know we just we just don't have the level of stability at the top i think in a lot of organizations to really make those positive changes Sorry, go ahead. No, well, I think, too, that we don't have it at the chief level. We do have it at that next level in some cases, which may be where we want to focus the deputy chief, assistant chief, whatever that title is in that in that second level. And they need to get out on on the street. But I also think as as certainly as part of the training, we need to make it OK to step back. In, in okay in a couple of ways let's say that lorenzo and we're riding run one person cars and lorenzo's leading the chase and the chase ends as most of them do now in my opinion and hopefully lorenzo will agree with me if not he can slap me the next time he sees me but he's probably not the guy that needs to go up to that car he's he's up on adrenaline he's angry he just shouldn't be the one to do it I'm two cars back, it, it should be okay. And we need to teach this for me to get up there. And I got to move quicker than I usually do, but I got to get to Lorenzo and say, Hey, I got this. Just step back. I got this. And for him to say, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm cool with that. And let me go up and, and deal with the individual. Presumably I am not as full of adrenaline and everything else as Lorenzo is. And oftentimes when that happens, you get a good result. You don't get the, you may have to use force, but as Gene noted, excessive force means that initially it was probably legitimate, but more often than not, I don't think you would because I'm calmer than Lorenzo was in that initial situation. So it's gotta be okay within the agency for me to do that for Lorenzo to say, yeah, I'm cool. That's fine. Go do that. And oftentimes in agencies, both of those are not thought of as good things. So as part of that, as part of the issue in doing that, I can see that, you know, we kind of, we would make the assumption that uh, officers have sort of the same or shared level of respect for other officers, shared level of beliefs, in the ways in which you know one officer will handle the situation relative to another, uh, and so we'd be okay passing that off. Is that the case, or I mean, we re we really need to look at like officer level variation in perceptions of other officers' abilities to do quote unquote do the job to address situations in the proper way? Uh, Lorenzo, I see you're unmuted, so you want to jump in. Any thoughts on that as well? That's absolutely not the case. There is not mutual respect because the state police dumps on city police, the city police will dump on county or the sheriff's department, even within divisions. You know, when I went to the motorcycles, I thought that because I'm a specialized unit that I'm better than people in patrol. Nobody likes the feds. We used to call the feds mushrooms. You keep them in the dark and you feed them crap. So to think that there's mutual respect is just not realistic. And I could not agree more with Jeff's point. And that's one of the things that I say, because people personalize things. You know, you made me chase you. You know, you're doing crime in my city. And it's like a personal affront to the officer. So whoever that lead person is, they're full of adrenaline. You need to pull them off and let somebody else at least initialize it. It could still be that first person's arrest. But once you take the, the uh, emotion out of it, because we're asking very emotional beings to make very rational choices. And we see that that doesn't work at all. That's a difficult thing to, that's a difficult thing to ask of people, right? Is, you know, one, are they trained that way? And there's been a lot of conversation in here about training, the role of education. I wanna to get to education in a minute, but that's a very difficult thing to ask people. Bobby, and then Jacinta. Uh, to my, my co-panelists here, correct me if I'm wrong, most of the research we have on officer behavior comes from municipal officers, city cops. 
the research that we have on uh, state police, highway patrol, generally around traffic stop. There's not a lot of research or not an equivalent amount of research on um, sheriffs, on deputies. A am I right? So there may also be a bias in the research community when it comes to our knowledge about different types of law enforcement. And I, I will be candid. I, I have found trying to work with a, as, a, as a researcher uh, with sheriff's departments and, and highway patrol agencies to be very different and it not necessarily being a positive difference uh, compared to working with city uh, officers, municipal agencies. Any, anyone else have uh, similar observations or experiences? Jacinta? Um, I don't, yeah, I mean, it's to, to, I think Dr. Brown and Dr. Boyd, you know, to follow up on their kind of points is, you know, the, the competition and sort of that, this is my arrest. And, you know, that's, you know, if, if, you know, in the, in the car chase, the vehicle chase scenario um, or vehicle pursuit scenario, um, yeah, you, the kind of mentality is, well, I, I did this, this is mine. You're not going to take that from me. And so you're absolutely right. Kind of get out of that, that mentality or that not just mentality, the reward structure, um, you know, for rewarding officers for doing these kinds of, of things instead of kind of being able to share credit, you know, both across officers, across units, across agencies, you know, that's, you know, I don't wanna get away from your question, but that's historically been a problem with, you know, just information sharing across agencies, you know, two neighboring agencies or even agencies in the same, you know, the county and the city in, in a jurisdiction, you know, they, they each have their own information systems and they don't talk to each other. And sometimes that's deliberate because they don't want the other agency to be able to take credit for what they've been doing in their, in their jurisdiction. And so it's, it's, it's unfortunate lack of communication and a willingness to collaborate because everybody is kind of seeking their own credit. And I can see that as being really problematic because if you are an officer and you're invested in doing your job and you're being essentially prevented from doing that because another officer won't share with you, right? That, I can see that's being a huge hit. You know, I wanna draw on, there's a question here, you know, thoughts from the panelists on ways to improve officer well-being, right? So a lot of things we've talked about, uh, particularly in this most recent conversation has to do with, you know, officers sort of visceral responses to a situation that they perceive to be an injustice or an affront to themselves. Are there ways that we can address that? Lorenzo, I see you came unmuted. Yeah, if, if you look at the, um, the president's final report on 21st century policing, there are six pillars. Pillar number six is officer safety and wellness. We spend a lot of time talking about police officers uh, killed in the line of duty, you know, feloniously killed. But for the third year in a row, Police officers died more from suicide than from homicide, but that's not something that we talk about. And uh, NYPD, they are averaging about one suicide per month. They're clearly not um, averaging one homicide of officers per month. We're not talking about that. But again, the reason is we're not allowed to say as an officer that something is wrong, that something's bothering you. Because as soon as you ask for help, it one, it shows weakness, and then other people will kind of gang up on you. But the other thing is, if you show any sort of weakness, the first thing they're going to do is take you off the road, possibly take away your sidearm. And that's the equivalent of clipping the wings of a bird. So a lot of officers tend to self-medicate. Um, alcoholism, police officers are 300 times more likely to become alcoholic than the general population. They're three times more likely to commit suicide than the general population because we're not allowed to do this. And only about 10% of police departments in the country have any sort of anti-suicide protocol. So if we open it up and make it okay for them, but again, it's also pretty hard for police officers for an agency to reach out to another agency for mutual aid. 
So it, it's that that lone wolf mentality that the police tend to have. And I think that in, inherently is problematic, but that's also part of the, the mentality of building the police. We're back to the toxic masculinity, right? Uh, and we're back to the, the militarization uh, of the police, which has been there uh, you know, for, forever. Um, that I, I'm still stuck on, on the suicide rate that you mentioned, uh, Lorenzo, because that's, you've got a double impact, right? A lot of the comments have talked about, and you know, we've talked about, and you talked about, and I've heard from law enforcement officers in Michigan just at a career fair that everyone is struggling with hiring people. They're struggling with getting good people. And we've got this, this very unfortunate juxtaposition where the job is creating these pressures and stresses that is, you know, that are leading people to feel the way out is to take their own lives. And we don't have an effective mechanism for recruiting enough good officers and training enough good officers to, so that we can alleviate the burden to alleviate some of that stress, but also to make sure that there's enough safety and that, you know, that we can, the, the agencies can do their job effectively, right? This sounds like a huge challenge. I mean, like, I don't even know where I'm going with that. It just sounds like a huge challenge. That I don't know how we start to wrap our hands around that. Well, peer support programs are starting to make some inroads in some of the individual officer issues. Uh, at least we are in the Birmingham, Alabama area. Uh, and we, we introduce ourselves to academy classes we talk about uh, who we are and what we do and state law and how it provides uh, confidentiality. And we're seeing some results, at least in terms of officers calling us. Uh, we go out to incidents and uh, as most peer support programs, I mean, we're not unique, we're modeling what other peer support programs do, but we go out to, to an incident and so we're there from the from the get go, and and we're helping. I think making some again making some inroads into some of those individual officer pressures, but the other stuff you talked about, Jay, it's still there. I mean, finding enough qualified people, uh, we, so that you got officers that aren't working 16, 18, 20, 24 hours, which some of them did during the protests in the spring and summer, I mean, come on. Uh, you, most officers can't work a 12 hour shift well, let's be honest. And we know that, and there's research to support that. So they don't do 12 hours well. And we wonder why when they hit the 16 hour mark or the 17 hour mark, that things are going south for them. And, and this issue of officer wellness is tied to recruitment and retention. We have people who are not selecting into the occupation because there's what they're seeing. They're seeing all of the stuff that concerned citizens are seeing and you're having folks who, who are deciding it's not worth it. And retaining officers, we have officers who are, who are burning out, who are stepping off the line. And this, this issue of wellness becomes important from that angle. So we, we've got a little bit of time left here um, and, and I wanna pivot a bit um, and get to one of the questions that we had here and sort of in a broader sense. We've been talking a lot about organizational training and uh, personnel development. Uh, we've talked essentially about counterproductive and deviant workplace behaviors. Um, you know, we, we've talked about the role of training and education going forward, the need for organizational reform. Now a question here about monitoring and measuring and rewarding individual and collective performance. As criminologists, right, as, a, as policing scholars, right, you are the experts that are working in this field. We know that as academics, we have a role to play in this. How can we start to build some collaborative relationships going forward across these disciplines, OB management, international humanistic management, right? Um, what do we need? Where are the opportunities for growth and collaboration moving forward, do you think? And how can we start to build those conversations? I'm going to jump in with a police culture um, reference here, but you know a lot of what we've talked about is police culture, and 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 in research that I've done, 
uh, it's a real handy term for people to say, well, it's the culture or we need to change the culture or look at the aggressive culture and what can we do differently. But we don't put our money where our mouth is in terms of real cultural studies. And it's not only something that a criminologist could do, but other groups that study organizational behavior. Um, I can't, I cannot document one pure police culture study. Anything that I've done on police culture has been crowbarred into another research project. And it's not as if, you know, Lorenzo, look all over the 21st century task force, culture is mentioned numerous times. Um, and you, we do have a different research agenda right now, at least from, from you know, the na on the national level. But where are these studies that would assist us in not only understanding police, but changing and reforming police? And I think that's a major deficiency that, that the field needs to address. Yeah, absolutely. How management and good managerial strategies, good organizational policies, how that can be instrumental in fixing all the problems that we've been talking about, starting in-house, right in there with, the, with cultural attitudes, starting with reward structures, incentive structures. How do we get the organizational environment in line with what we're expecting to see from officers on the street. And as a secondary note to that, you know, most police agencies and, and people that examine the police, they overestimate the culture component, meaning the, the negative culture component. There are a lot of good officers in agencies. It's the small group of bad officers that drive the negative perceptions, the negative behavior and the negative outcomes. And so, you know, it's almost as if there's kind of a, a fear of understanding culture. And I've had police chiefs tell me to, to my face, I don't really want to know about the climate here because I'll have to do something about it. And it assumes that it's all negative. I mean, there's a lot of positive things that go that are going on in agencies. And, you know, if, if we could adjust maybe the smaller contingent of folks that are off the tracks and it could be done with training with the good folks, um, we could see some successful outcomes. When we talk about the, the culture of a department, and I always say that the vast majority of police officers are God-fearing, law-abiding citizens trying to do the right thing. But then the question is always begged to be asked, where are all of these good officers when all these bad officers are doing really bad stuff? And if they're not standing up to do something, are they really good officers? Do we really need to legislate a duty to intervene for police who are supposed to intervene anyway? So when, when we talk about the, the culture thing, and I remember going through the academy, I remember who I was as a person going through the academy, and I remember who I was five years in, and I remember at the 10-year mark, I saw that I was changing. So now looking back at my career in uniform, I changed a lot because I was sucked up into the culture of policing and looking at it from the inside, even, even with the end of one, I put, uh, I, I put a lot of stock in culture. But to get to Jay's point more directly, how do we change this? We need to change the lens because most policing research comes out of criminal justice. And as a classically trained sociologist, I try to view it a little differently. If we bring in people from psychology, if we bring in people from business, if we start looking at things pragmatically, it's the view, it's the lens that we do. Because as much as I view the world through a policing lens for my nearly 15 years uh, in the sheriff's department, the other lens, I've been black a whole lot longer than I've been blue. So that lens matters as well. If we can adjust the lenses, then we can uh, have different perspectives. Um, I, I want to say something that's pretty simple, and it's worked actually well with agencies. Call a criminologist. Reach out to your local criminologist. We are there. We are present. The possibility for some very uh, interdisciplinary, powerful research projects could happen. We have some of us have access or can gain access to agencies. And we could actually go in and do some things from an evaluation perspective, a training perspective. 
Not everything has to uh, revolve around an RFP that was sent out by someone. There, there are actually people out there um, in agencies who are interested in some problems being addressed. What Gene pointed out is absolutely correct. There are some questions that folks do not want to touch because they do not want to deal with the answer. But there are opportunities that criminologists could be useful in, in, in uh, taking advantage of. We just might not have the training, the, the organizational or management training to look at a certain problem. Uh, but reach out to your, your, your local regional criminologist, reach out to a criminologist who has published something relevant to what you're interested in. We are, folks may be surprised at how willing we are to, to be partners. Um, that's it. Jeff, you are muted. Well, I was just gonna say a number of agencies and a lot of it depends on, on who's approaching and how you're approaching. But Dr. Brown is exactly right. There are a lot of agencies who would welcome uh, some answers to some problems uh, without question. Our problem as in academia in many cases is we're waiting, you know, the, the, the question is often, okay, how much money am I gonna make in this? How much money is the university gonna make? And I think sometimes if we wanna advance and make this a better profession, we just have to go do it. We've got graduate students that could help us. We've got colleagues that could help us uh, go out and, and, and ask some questions. What do you need help with? Uh, how can we do this better? And it may not be what we necessarily want to do. It may not be what we think they ought to be doing, if that makes sense. But do it, get that foot in the door do it well introduce your graduate students to those agency to the ability of doing research and i promise you down the road better opportunities will will occur and maybe even to the question you really ultimately want to get to or as gene said weave that question into whatever it is that you're doing if it's at all possible so I will uh, remind, and I'm sure uh, you know, the group has seen this, uh, at least the policing group that NIJ recently released a, uh, an RFP looking at um, policing and civil disorder. Uh, so obviously very timely given what's going on, great opportunity to potentially collaborate. I've noticed in the chat, some people talking about um, research they have going on, research that they have uh, uh, planned. Uh, I, I would wholly, wholly, um, uh, reinforce uh, uh, Dr. Brown Bobby's point about reaching out and collaborating. Um, this all started because I reached out to Jill Brown and said, you know, I love the letter you put out. I, I'd love to talk about this. Um, there are, I think, a world of opportunities uh, that we could uh, that we could address uh, going forward. I think there's opportunity, and uh, the Sim Division and, and EMA have mentioned they're willing to support uh, future discussions. Uh, around these topics, there are there questions that we did not, we did not get to here, uh, but I'm sure that all of us would love to engage with you going forward. Um, we have uh, in the chat, you'll see, uh, I believe Eric has put in uh, email addresses uh, for everyone here. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, look forward to developing another discussion. Uh, before we end out, I'd like to throw it back to the panelists uh, and give each of you an opportunity to say some brief closing remarks uh, if you have something you'd like to share. So I guess we'll start with Dr. Gao. I knew you were gonna call on me. <laughs> uh, I was trying to look away, like maybe he won't see me. <laughs> no, I just really appreciate everybody being here. It's so awesome to have this conversation. Um, it's, it's really innovative. Um, you know, that final question about, you know, why would we work together? Why, you know, it always, it's the allegory of the, the blind people studying the elephant, right? Like everybody's got like their own section. And if all that's, if that's all you study, then that's all, that's what you think it's going to be. And you're not correct. You only have a piece of it. And so, you know, if we all are kind of bringing our expertise together, studying different aspects of this, then we can really, we can actually construct a holistic understanding of the problem. And then that's where we begin with our development of holistic 
uh, multilateral solutions to it. So I really appreciate everybody being here. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Boyd, and then I'll come to you, Bobby. Thank you. First of all, um, I, I'm really honored to be on, on this panel because everyone that's on the panel, you're not only people that I admire your work and reference all the time, but I actually know everybody on the panel and, and count them as friends. So I'm really honored to be on the panel. Let's not stop at where we are with policing. There's a lot of things that we just assume. Let's not just take policing at face value. Let's think what if, what would happen if we change this? And I, I acknowledge that we've been doing policing the same way, you know, since professionalism was ushered in a hundred years ago, but let's reimagine how we do policing. You know, the, the history of the jungle is written from the perspective of the hunter. The lion doesn't get to tell his story because the lion is captured or the lion is killed or the lion has the hunter kneeling on its neck for nine minutes. What would happen if we studied policing from the perspective of the community? Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Brown. Thank you. And uh, I, I echo the sentiments by, by uh, those who've gone before me here. I, I just wanna really encourage everyone to not get distracted by the high profile issues that we see in policing. Pol we have so much more than the use of force and the use of deadly force, excessive force to, to pay attention to when it comes to policing. Um, and, and while I was waving my hand, I, I immediately wanted to go after Jacinta to, uh, because I think that's exactly what she was getting at. And what Lorenzo is talking about, the, the perspective of those who experience policing why we are seeing the unrest that we see today, it's not because one person was killed and it's not because one person was killed and it was caught on tape. It's because the people who experience policing in America day to day are fed up. We know that very few people are killed by the police. It's not so simple as the police using excessive force. People are not upset at j just over uh, the use of, of force. People are upset about the way they experience policing, the routine contacts that, he, that they've had. And we need to make sure that we are paying attention to everything that's happening in policing to try to bring about the, the change uh, to, to reimagine and redesign policing as Lorenzo put it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. Rush, we'll head over to you. I can unmute myself. Uh, what they said, absolutely without question, all of uh, my colleagues are 100% are correct. Uh, it certainly is an honor to be involved in this. And a lot of what we've talked about are organizational issues that in many cases, people from the, the, the business and training and organizational fields are better better organize and and have better resources to help us bring some change to policing uh, which i definitely think uh, we need to do and and i would echo what dr brown said uh, jay mentioned the rfp for study and protests or ever how it's worded i i just saw it myself the other day that that may solve how we respond to protests and riots, but as Dr. Brown certainly alluded to, that doesn't, that's not going to answer the day-to-day -day questions of how we do policing. It's not gonna answer the questions of how uh, the people respond to policing. And so let's don't get caught up in the, uh, the idea that this is the most important thing uh, right now because maybe the feds think it's important this is a day-to-day -day process. This is a day-to-day -day st study and struggle. And we have to rethink how we do policing, how we do police training and who we recruit in order to make this profession better. Because the profession itself, policing itself is not going to go away. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Paolini, you're wrapping us up. Right on. 
Well, it's been a pleasure to be on this panel. I mean, one of the most encouraging things for me is throughout the series of questions and the chats that I've had the privilege to see as they pop up, uh, to none of these questions was there an answer, a single word answer, oh, this is exactly what we need to do. And it just points to the complexity of what we're examining here and, and the thought that we're putting into it. We have a panel of, of diverse backgrounds and experiences and research methodologies, and, and none of us were able to say, this is exactly what we need to do tomorrow to change things. Um, you know, in, in, in pointing out some of what was brought to bear here today, uh, we shouldn't underestimate the problems that we have in policing. And at the same time, we shouldn't overestimate the problems that we have in policing. And, and there are good police officers out there doing the right thing, whether they're willing to step up or whether they're even willing to be in those scenes as, as Lorenzo pointed out, um, one of the more encouraging differences between Ferguson and what we're seeing today for me is the police response, whether it's ceremonial or not, but almost across the board, we saw you know, condemning behavior. Whereas historically we've seen, let's wait until the investigation comes out. Let's wait until we see how things play out. Um, this has been, you know, a categorical no to these types of behaviors, whether we've hit that threshold or not. Um, and then a final note on collaborating with police agencies. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree that get your foot in the door, work with those agencies, but at the same time, don't devalue what you're doing in the sense of we shouldn't always provide free labor because if you know police budgets and you see the way police bring in experts after the fact when there's an issue or they bring in trainers, there's money and budgets for good research. And so definitely, you know, use those mechanisms to get your foot in the door, but don't devalue the skills that you bring to an agency, whether it's from a criminal justice side only or whether you're collaborating with other folks. Um, those should, and it'll make you, it'll, it'll help your research as well. But it's been a pleasure to talk about these these uh, experiences and these issues. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have uh, the, the five of you on. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and starting out this initial discussion from the chats uh, I've been reading as of late. Uh, there's a lot of interest in moving this forward. So hopefully uh, we can set up another uh, event in a timely fashion. Uh, thank you very much from me uh, for indulging me and in, in, in leading this. Uh, Erica, I will kick it back over to you for any wrap up, but uh, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, again, huge thanks to Jay. I hope you all can hear me. I'm not sure how my connectivity is. Um, who took um, a risk and initiated this um, with the Social Issues and Management Division and the International Humanistic Management Association. It truly is a privilege to host this type of transdisciplinary conversation. I can tell you on behalf of the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility, and by extension, the Manning School of Business and the School of Criminology and Justice Studies at UMass Lowell, it's been an honor. Um, and we look forward to further events, further opportunities, um, further collaboration. So I, while this is the first time I've seen many of you, I hope it will not be the last. Um, many, many thanks. Be well, everyone, and uh, look forward to our next set of initiatives together. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Be well. Thank you, everyone. Bye.